the actual subtitle of this talk needs to be, uh, how long will it take Matthew to spill this water into the laptop? Well, it'll be a fun game we can, we can play while I'm talking here. Uh, it is kind of weird, in a good way, to be back here in the same hotel that we had the, the flock in before, because I go around a corner somewhere, go into an elevator, I have a memory of conversations with people who, you know, uh, some of you are here in this room, some people uh, have gone on to other things, but um, I'm really excited to make some new, long-lasting memories at this flock here. Um, this is me. You, uh, I think I know most of you. Uh, if I don't know you, I'm looking forward to getting to know you. Um, also, this is the first time, um, really, usually for these talks, I put up some pictures and maybe some terse words and then do a stream of conscious kind of thing. I assure you there will be plenty of stream of conscious talking, but also the Fedora Council at large helped me put together this deck and contributed a whole lot. So thank you very much to the council for that. Um, and also, uh, we'll see how it goes. Um, this is the basic thing I'm going to present, you know, the traditional charts and graphs in a very abbreviated form because there's a lot of other stuff to talk about. Um, we did a survey about AI. The Fedora Council has been asked by a community to come up with a, Paul, Jim, don't laughing at me. Uh, the uh, Fedora Council has been asked to come up with a policy on how AI, particularly the large language model stuff that is all of the hype right now, how that fits into Fedora. So uh, we did a community survey, and so I have a, so that, that just ended last week, so we haven't really had time to analyze it, but I have some early things and thoughts on that. I'm gonna talk about strategy 2028, and then a specific problem that is actually kind of related to one of the things we want to solve as part of the strategy, and kind of dive into that a little bit, and then, you know, wrap things up. And actually, I just have one graph uh, this year, but I, before I show the graph, I want to present this, which I've um, done traditionally. The, we never will do invasive tracking in Fedora, and so there's no real way for us to say exactly what's going on, how many Fedora Linux systems there are out there, and what um, yeah, the details about any of that. So uh, the graph is more like an archeological expedition. We're kind of putting together dinosaur bones and seeing what kind of uh, planter they assembled themselves into rather than doing a controlled study. So um, take that with a grain of salt. Um, but yeah, uh, so here is, this, this is the one graph. This is um, over the last few years, the number of uh, systems checking in with a different Fedora release number over, um, over time. Um, last year, this I was kind of worried that if you, if you look at the middle purpley one there, things were kind of leveling off, and it was a little bit, a little bit worrying that there's to see a drop there. Um, here, I still don't love it, but I'm, we're definitely going up again after that peak. Um, I, you know, there's a, you draw a pretty, pretty good slope there. I would definitely like to see that going up more steeply, and I hope that the strategy 28 work once it hits its stride will really help us do that. Um, and yeah, then right into the AI. So, um, so technology under this name, AI, what, what it, uh, which is kind of a broad category, but right now generally means uh, generative AI and related things done with large language models. Um, like that's coming to us whether we like it or not, so we need some guidelines. Fedora doesn't make it our decisions from a top down, like uh, I never get to decree what will happen and then have that thing happen, um, as much as that would sometimes be nice. Uh, it's the way we do things really is to try and find a community consensus and build what we do around that. So the Fedora Council decided to do a survey and we got almost 2,000 complete responses. Um, I think about 300 of those from people who identify as Fedora contributors. Is that right? Yeah, okay. Thank you, Robert. Um, and then uh, the rest from people who identified just as a Fedora user. Some of the contributors, of course, also are Fedora users, probably most of us. Um, but uh, we also got a, you know, a lot of feedback from that demographic of just you know, people who identify as just end users, which uh, I think is also very valuable. And I've split some of these results up into that. Um, and also, I guess I lied, there's a couple more graphs here. Um, so I didn't, uh, I'm not really gonna present a detailed analysis. So one of the questions was, uh, is AI useful for um, a, different examples in, in the, uh, the areas that it could be done? Um, I 
forgetting what the exact things are right now, but just a variety of possible use cases. And so uh, I lumped those all together into whether people said no for everything over here on the side or yes for everything over on that side. Um, I think, and then in the middle, the green is uncertain. People who either left everything as uncertain or had a mix of yes for this, no for that kind of thing. Um, I think the main takeaway here is we have a you know, kind of a full spectrum of opinions here. Uh, it definitely, there's a pretty strong no contingent, um, which I am not surprised to see, um, but really a lot of uncertainty about it, which is also, um, you know, going to be a challenge as we go forward and try and figure out what to do. Um, also, some people who are really excited about things. Um, and this is the same thing for uh, specifically, would you like to see AI used for specific things in Fedora? And uh, again, it's basically the same kind of pattern there, although it's interesting to see that, you know, when we narrowed it down to that, it's a little, little bit wider on the yes things there than just kind of the general, but it's still really basically the same, same picture here. Um, uh, the slight increase might be because uh, a lot of people were concerned about a personal assistant in Fedora. And so um, when we had the ability to you know, say yes to um, lots of things, but no to that, I think that kind of that may have swayed this a little bit. But um, yeah, we're going to look specific, you know, do more diving into specific trends and things we got out of that to help us shape our policy. But um, this is the preliminary thing here. Um, also, I, I read all of the comments. Um, <laughs> which, you know, there's a general rule about that, but I did it anyways. Uh, some of them were a lot less nice than this even. Some of them certainly could not go on slides. Um, there were some nice ones too, um, there's, which I, you know, I, I appreciate this one a little bit more. And I, there were a lot of times where I read a comment and there was a juxtaposed one right next to it. And that was, that, that was the case here in the, the way the ordering happened to be. And I thought that was just perfect. Um, I, um, you know, I don't know what to do with the first one, but thank you for everyone who feels about, who feels the second one. Um, I also, um, this was my favorite comment. Um, so, uh, so uh, I, <laughs> Um, a a AI or not, I think everyone who works with computers feels like maybe this is the, this is the way to go sometimes. But, uh, yeah. uh, but really, there were a whole lot of thoughtful comments. Uh, some of them were really long, considered responses. I read all those. I appreciate them. They don't fit on slides so well. Um, there, there were one or two that seemed like they were really long AI-generated responses, which, uh, yeah, yeah, not, not, not surprised. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Um, but really, the key thing I want to show is that we're nowhere near a consensus on any of this. Um, so um, I did, as I went through it, uh, kind of kept in mind some different buckets, like what is this comment all about? And this is particularly focusing on what people are concerned about because we want to make sure that we take those concerns seriously. Um, so these are kind of the big themes. And for both users and contributors, they came up in kind of the same different categories, although a little bit different in prioritization. So these are in or priority order, basically. The big thing for Fedora users was, you know, don't force this on us. Make sure that anything's there is optional. I, you know, a lot of I don't care as long as I don't have to choose it or that kind of thing. Um, and then you know, keep it local, private is also a really big concern there. Uh, that one was actually a lower priority for Fedora contributors. So let's keep that in mind, contributors. Our users really care about that. Um, and then, uh, uh, one of the other things um, that maybe is less um, self-explanatory here, the uh, ethics license washing thing here. A lot of people, um, people were concerned about you know, how the data is collected for large language models. You know, are people compensated? Did people, you know, it was the information that came in, did people give their permission for their, uh, you know, their creative work to be used in that way? Uh, and then the license washing concern I see as related, which is a lot of content, you know, like on Wikipedia or GPL, we have a concept of you share alike, copy left, which is if, you know, I'm, I'm giving this gift to the world when what I want in return is you keep sharing. And uh, as 
far as the law goes right now, the output of large language models is uh, probably not copyrightable, basically public domain, and then therefore can be um, used in a copyrighted work, proprietary software, however you want. So it seems kind of weird that something that's trained on a large amount of data that people wanted to be used in a share-alike way can be magically transformed um, into something that can be used in a not sharing way. And I think that's a, um, the uh, lawyers have looked at this and they, uh, they, they're, uh, the legal risk is not really a gigantic concern right now. Uh, where I think we, we have to go ahead to, go to, to do things and not worry about that from that point of view. I've talked to Red Hat Legal about this. Um, However, I think whether or not the math works out that you know, it's transformative enough or all of those things, I think that ethical concern really still is real and something really important. And then also the environmental impact, the electricity usage going up and large tech companies you know, not being able to meet their climate change goals because now they're burning so much more electricity on GPUs. That's also a pretty big concern that came up here a lot, so yeah. Um, so I generally try not to say out loud a bunch of stuff that repeats the text on the slides, but I really want to be clear about a couple things here. Um, yeah, first, there's not an easy answer. We don't have consensus. Um, there is a lot of hype, but there is a lot of useful stuff that people are really interested in doing. Uh, but we're not going to put a personal assistant that you can't remove that snoops all your data and sends it to a data collection thing into the OS or anything even remotely approaching that. Uh, we're not going to run a cloud service. I don't know where we would get the infrastructure to do anything like that, to run like a gigantic large language model chatbot thing. Um, although we actually uh, are using some things like in the, our discussion forum, um, that is a hosted service and um, our provider for that, we asked them, can we do some of the things you are providing using open source or at least open-ish um, language models behind the scenes. So if you uh, look on the Fedora discussion, for example, um, if you upload an image, uh, there is an option to automatically give a caption to it generated by you know, examining it and uh, generative AI to write a caption for that image. And that works pretty well. Um, not perfect, but I think it's a uh, it is an important accessibility thing to have, you know, when you have an image in a form like that, to have it you know, described. And so even if the description isn't perfect, I think that gives a good starting point and an encouragement for people to do that thing. So we have some stuff like that going on right now. Um, yeah, we had, uh, you know, comments were like, you know, ban it all. Um, yeah, you know, for, uh, with some of the concerns, I, I can understand that sentiment, but um, we're pretty unlikely to actually issue a complete ban. Uh, particularly, uh, you know, code is going to come to us from upstream that already has this. Um, people are going to use it whether we say don't do it or not, and I think a ban would be um, impossible. So I, uh, but also, there are some really interesting things that we could do, hopefully um, taking into account those considerations as we do them. And finally, like Fedora is about experimenting. We want to give people a space to do things. So um, even if it's not your thing, um, if there is a Fedora, a there, there may be a you know, Fedora AI spin or space or something that um, we make room for people who are interested in that to experiment in. I, I, I'm not declaring that an outcome, but um, I think that is likely that Fedora is going to find some way to make some room there. Okay, here's a spill water on laptop moment. Good job. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so and moving on. Um, so we've been talking about this for a while, but a, a quick refresh, strategy 28. It's our plan for project growth over the next few years. Um, and the metric for this, um, like is this working? Uh, we want to double the number of Fedora contributors who are active every week. Um, I often get questions about, do you mean you want to double um, every week, you want to double the number of people? Yes, that's exactly what I want to do. We want to have an um, infinite number of people by like week, whatever. Um, yeah, no. Uh, <laughs> um, it's the other thing, uh, but it's hard to phrase it in a concise way. Otherwise. Um, so uh, that, that's not our end goal. The goal is to grow the project, be able to do more things, keep things healthy, but I think this is a 
a really good metric for whether whether that is happening, whether we're an, invite, you know, we're an inviting community, we're growing, we have new people coming in and have enough resources, um, you know, which really the biggest thing is people's time and interest. So we have enough of that to do all the things we want to do. Um, we talked to, you know, had community discussions and came up with a bunch of things people were interested in. They are roughly bucketed into these themes, which you don't really need to worry about. I'm not gonna drill into them right now, but um, those are kind of the areas. Um, you can look on Fedora discussion for a lot more about all of this. Um, so I'm gonna highlight some of the work that's going on in these things. Um, if any of them are interest to you, uh, we'd love your help. Um, and there are other areas of the strategy that aren't really active yet that I'm not going to list. Um, accessibility is a really big one that we have a, you know, a lot of concerns. Some of the, there's uh, effort on deck for some of those things. Uh, local communities around the world kind of reviving the thing where we had you know little small local user groups in you know Latin America, India, uh, all over um, that. Uh, are less active than they used to be. We want to make sure we give support to people in those areas and kind of help build up those communities. Um, that's some future things. Um, and there's a lot more. Um, if there's anything that strikes you as interesting that you'd like to start, you can go ahead and start it. You don't need permission for it, but you know, come talk to the Fedora Council. If you want to do something at all in Fedora that you think will help the project, you know, look at the strategy and see how it might be aligned and we can help you get resources to do that. Um, so, yeah, going through <laughs> some of these things, one of the big th themes is mentorship and you know, the idea that uh, Fedora is, is people when it comes right down to it, and uh, having people help each other is that's one of the most smooth ways to get someone new into into feeling welcome and understanding how things work. Uh, you know, this is, we've been around as Fedora for 20 years and there's a lot of deep knowledge and it can be very confusing. So having that personal touch is important. The overall theme of the mentorship um, area is that uh, the goal of everyone is a mentor and everyone can, uh, everyone has a mentor, men God, let me try this again. Okay. Uh, Everyone is a mentor and everyone has a mentor. Look, that was very simple. Um, and, and, and that can be also, you know, everyone has the, um, has the confidence and knows that they can be a mentor and everyone who wants a mentor has the opportunity to get one that's kind of a, a weaker version of it. I like the concise, strong version, but um, yeah, we have a lot of work here. This is a first step towards that goal. There will be further things. This, this lo largely focused on kind of our internship programs and the mentorship we've done traditionally around that, but there are future things we want to kind of grow from that into support for everyone. Uh, there's a mentor summit panel discussion and a workshop later this week. If you're interested in this um, or think maybe you might be, um, please attend and pay attention to those. There's some of the ways we are hoping to support that. Um, we also have a team called Community Operations, ComOps. Um, despite our best efforts to not call it ComOps, it, keeps, it becomes ComOps every time. Um, and this isn't a trek actually directly attached to one of those pillars, but really is a team to support a lot of the things we need to have around that, kind of looking at, at the metrics, providing us with that uh, guiding star number of what, you know, what are our active contributors right now, um, and then also, uh, kind of helping some of the things that you know, I do, that Justin do, the, the FPL uh, leadership roles, kind of moving some of those things into the broader community, both so I become a little bit less insane, maybe, um, but also uh, just to give more community empowerment for things, um, like you know, uh, running the elections, those kind of things that you know, can be done, should, should be done in the community. Um, Okay, uh, then this is a, a technical one. Um, despite the name bootable containers, it is not about virtual machines. Uh, this is the next generation of RPM OS tree, the technology that's underneath CoreOS and Silverblue and Atomic Desktops. And the basic thing is, instead of whatever you do to make the infrastructure for the RPM OS tree and create a new, you know, new, new version of that, um, which, you know, it doesn't matter what it is, but it, it's, it's a something you have to learn and a whole new thing. And you know, kind of esoteric and very Fedora, well, very specific to our ecosystem. Um, 
The idea here is instead of doing that, um, your layers that you put on top are basically just Docker files or container files, um, which have a from line. So you basically have the um, you, your some base image that represents you know the, the uh, a minimal Fedora Linux, and then you can just uh, have a container that says from Fedora, and then does uh, you know whatever you want a normal in a Docker file, and then that gets deployed onto your actual you know, physical machine or VM, and it's actually not run in a container anymore. It just becomes the deployment mechanism, and then um, you can also. That just like you can keep doing that with containers, you can then derive new things from that. So we could have, you know, from Silverblue from, is from Fedora, and then you can do from Silverblue to make your own thing and so on down. And all of these containers can just be built with whatever normal infrastructure you have to build containers, which there are a lot of options for. Um, you can use Quay or whatever to automatically build things. Uh, I think this is really cool and powerful. Um, yeah, uh, there's both the, uh, you know, this is a, not, not learn a new thing, but this is a very widespread approach and technology out there um, that is, you're ad we're adopting and bringing in. So kind of bringing cloud native ways of doing things into the base OS, I think that's um, gonna be very powerful and so that anybody can do it. I think it would be neat to see what kind of exciting new things we get with that. Also, um, <laughs> about 10 years ago, I drew this on a whiteboard, and this was at one of my, my, uh, my talk at the first flock um, in 2013 or something like that. Um, you could see I have learned to count all the way up to four since then. Um, yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, I was going yeah, uh, I was going to draw a new version that's kind of adapted for oh we could do this with Bootsy which is kind of where, where I'm going with this um, but as I started to do it I was like hey, actually the thing I drew there it needs a few adjustments but it is it, it's basically something we could do so the idea is like the ring zero core there something extremely minimal just like enough to boot to system D and test it and not not in really a runnable system and. The reason for this is, uh, as you add things on, um, w if you want to remove stuff, you're not actually saving any space because of technical blah, blah, blah. Um, hopefully that will get worked out sometime, but Docker's been that way since the beginning and no one's fixed it, so not holding your breath. Um, so it's better to have things that go up from small to bigger. Um, so starting with that minimal is good. And uh, ideally, I think we could have something like that that you know we could uh, all of the things at the system D level, ideally, uh, we could just rev forward, and we might not need to have like you know different versions. It's, this could go across um, all of our. We'd roll that out to the older versions as well, and keep kind of simplify that, kind of make that little core be rolling. I think that would be interesting. I'm not saying we need to, but that would be one thing. Um, and then, kind of a, a, a central platform that again has. Uh, as pretty minimal, but has just the basic things that everyone agrees on. I can go into all this a lot more, but um, I think that uh, I would like to see all of Fedora, all of our main additions and spins kind of use this technology to put things together because it makes building blocks for other people to work on and um, will be a lot more understandable than our current way of doing things and I think uh, also testable at different levels. Um, as you get up to the ring two, I did that all wrong. I have different, there are different ways we could do that. But um, yeah, I, I'm excited about this and come talk to me about it if it sounds like a, um, if it sounds like a crazy idea or a good idea. Either way, um, I think that, um, again, moving on, uh, one of our other uh, big, um, big parts of the strategy is getting Fedora Linux onto hardware pre-installed. Um, this is you know, when one, of the, one of the most difficult things in you know, switching to Linux or starting with Fedora is like, getting it on a machine. And so it often, you know, w when you go to a store, you buy a Mac with you know, Mac OS on it, you, or you buy a PC with Windows, like you don't have to like, start with, a, oh no, I need a bunch of technical knowledge to even start with my system. Um, so having this there, um, is important, and so um, the marketing team, Joseph, 
uh, started this uh, initiative. Um, it, this was also a thing that like, we hadn't top down from the council said we're gonna start this now, but um, yeah, marketing team started doing it and we cleared this with uh, Red Hat Legal. We're gonna have a Fedora ready logo that vendors can use and we'll have a page that kind of for each of the vendors saying here's the stuff that you know, we know works. So I think that'll be Great. Um, we're starting with some laptops vendors here. I would like to see like um, some IoT devices, edge devices, Risk Five. I'm looking at you, Isaac. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so we'll, we'll see how that that goes. Um, Joseph has a, a talk later today, I think, about um, marketing hopes and dreams in Fedora. So if that kind of thing is interesting to you, definitely go to that. Um, and then um, this thing called collaboration tooling or communications collaboration tooling. This is one of those things that um, when we started the initiative, it's like, oh no, this is actually five different initiatives or maybe 10, but also there's a bunch of little small things. Um, so it's, it, it's really a number of different things, current and upcoming. Um, and I actually wanna dig into this one a little bit. Um, so there's currently a, a thread on Fedora discussion that started a few days ago, it's very timely, um, docs, people talking about how scattered our documentation is across a whole bunch of different platforms and technologies. We've got quick docs on docs.fedoraproject.org, and then also on docs.fedoraproject.org, there's workstation documentation, which is really incomplete compared to the quick docs. So why are those things spread out like that? And then we've got wiki pages, we've got uh, how-tos people have made on Ask Fedora, there's FAQs, um, there are all sorts of different scattered things just for docs alone. But actually, I think the problem is even wider than that, and um, I'm going to explain it with some Venn diagrams. Um, I hope you like Venn diagrams. <laughs> um, yeah, thank you. Um, so I'm actually gonna start with the GitForge situation where um, we have, uh, uh, Pagger has been our forge for a long time since we switched from using uh, a bunch of different track instances, um, TRA, See, um, don't don't look at look at it unless you want some nightmares. Um, but so we switched, and we largely, you know, uh, Pegger has been our our main uh, dist git uh, instance, and also a lot of our project stuff is also there. But over the years, people have kind of spread out to other things. So uh, you know, Fedora websites, uh, Fedora legal, those are on um, GitLab.com/fedora, a, a free space provided us. You know, as, as a gift from um, GitLab. Um, a lot of people you know, are using GitHub for things. A lot of Fedora, like you know, Bodhi upstream, like that's on GitHub. Uh, a lot of stuff is all sorts of different places. And um, you know, doc sources are scattered around. And a lot of different teams can use different places for this is where we do our planning and tracking and that kind of thing. Um, which, yeah, I highlight that. <laughs> um, where we end up having all this scattered areas, like, okay, I want to interface with CoreOS, I need to know that I need to like, find them on GitHub, or uh, the design team, oh yeah, they're on GitLab, and this, um, this makes it really hard to um, definitely come in as a newcomer and figure out what's going on, but also is difficult and confusing, I think, for most of us in this room. If you're not confused by it, then um, okay you've got a better map of things in your head than I, I do. Um, and so, yeah, another thing that kind of happens with this is that um, you get, uh, GitForge issues end up being used as a uh, mailing list replacement, as a forum, because our mailing lists, you know, mailing lists are limited in a lot of ways. Um, we're not really great for uh, sharing images and all that, and kind of, um, so we end up like, like the design team has basically used you know, Pagger as their main mailing list for a long time. In some ways, Fesco sometimes, despite best efforts to not make it this way, Fesco issues, well, like a huge amount of discussion there. And um, issues make a really bad forum. They're okay if you have like some concise things and decisions, but if you have like 300 comments in a you know, Pagger issue especially, like uh, that's, that's no good. <laughs> the, you, no, one, no one can keep up with that. Um, so I think that's something that kind of happened um, because we didn't have good answers to that. This kind of spread sort of naturally happens. Um, and you know, in Fedora, um, since we 
don't tend to be like, this is the way you must do it, or you're not part of Fedora. Um, we've, we've, we've let people do that, which is okay, but um, it, it does, has really kind of made this problem. Um, and I think that a lot of this, you know, we have these team homes where, like I said, you know, the design team is over here, CoreOS is over here, that have mostly landed you know, not on Pagger um, in other places than there. Some, some team homes might be on the wiki. In fact, um, I, here's my exploded view <laughs> with, with a lot more things that are connected. It's you know, worse than just the Git forges. It's all the stuff is connected together. Like in Diskit, we've got um, merge requests that go there, and merge requests are you know, pretty tightly linked to issues usually, but instead our issues are over on Bugzilla, which is completely unlinked to it, um, or you know, very very lightly linked. That's um, actually really confusing. I've seen cases where you know, there's a packager who's like, oh, I don't ever pay attention to the merge reviews, you should really just need to file that in Bugzilla. Or you have somebody who, like, oh yeah, I'm, could you submit that as a merge request when someone you know, goes through the effort to file a bug? All of that um, is not very friendly to people. Um, yeah, um, docs are all over the place in different bubbles. If I had done this properly as intersecting diagrams, um, it would have been just like some really complicated circles. Uh, what's that? I said you would have gone insane. Yeah, yeah, I would have gone insane. So that's why I duplicated things instead of doing that. Thank you, Adam. Um, yeah. Um, and then um, you know the wiki has a place with those team homes, and some people basically like their team is on like on Matrix. Like, oh yeah, if you want to participate in this, join our Matrix channel. Um, and I think that kind of mirrors what we see at a lot of projects where um, Discord, the, the gaming chat platform, not Discourse, the forum software. Um, it's not the forum software's people's fault. They were like six months before with their name. But um, so a lot of like projects really like things you see that as like you know join our Discord. That's where you get help and everything. And I think leaving aside that that's a proprietary platform with all of those issues around that. Um, that it's also very transient. You don't end up with long-term documentation and um, a place where other people can go. So I think that really makes kind of a bad home. And um, yeah, so I, I hope that we can find another answer for that. Um, and in fact, um, here's what I'd like to get to uh, once we have a, a new forge in place. I would like to pull a lot of the things that people have not been able to do in you know in Pagger, um, attract people to come come make make our new centralized Fedora Forge your home for your project. Uh, make sure that it has the features and things that people need to do that. And so a lot of things get pulled into that. And then um, I think um, if you know if there's a, we still are probably not going to dictate you must do that or you can't be in part of Fedora. Uh, people have pretty established workflows, like you know, CoreOS stuff on GitHub. That would be a very big lift to move all of that over. Um, ideally, we could make mirrors and bridges for things like that. But what I'd really like to ask as a requirement, is just a baseline, is that every team have a section on this Git Forge that they keep up to date that at least says here's where you go to find our team stuff. And so we can kind of use, use that as a directory. Um, I, I hope we can get to that. Um, and you know, most of the other Forges stuff be upstream. I also would like to pull a lot of stuff into um, discussion. Uh, it's a very flexible platform that can do a lot of things. I know people have opinions on this, but um, I will not use up all the rest of the time on that. Um, in case you've missed it, uh, we are doing an ongoing investigation into what platform we should use for this mythical new Git Forge. And the Fedora Council has narrowed it down to two candidates. Uh, they are either Forgio, which is a Gitia fork that um, now powers codeberg.org and has got a lot of community energy behind it, or GitLab CE. Uh, I know last time we had a really big discussion about you know changing our Git Forge, uh, there was a very, very strong um, underlying sentiment that we needed to have, you know, at least Diskit needs to be an open source platform. Um, and you know, GitLab.com is not an open source platform. Um, and so if we go with GitLab, it would be, will be GitLab CE, uh, which, okay, not to get too sidetracked, but because it's an open core project, that actually has some uh, big 
uh, limitations, there are a lot of features that would be really useful, which actually are proprietary features in GitLab and which exist in Forgio. So it actually might be easier for people who are using GitLab stuff now to come to Forgio for, for the um, possible uh, yeah, things that it can do because it's open source. I guess I, I have an opinion on this. I'm not trying to put my hand on the scale, but I think I think Forge is the more exciting choice for Fedora. But um, GitLab also has some big advantages. It's aligned with a lot. You know, Red Hat is using GitLab for a lot of their processes, and it would be aligned there. Um, so. Yeah, um, so there's an ongoing investigation, especially focused around Diskit right now. There's a talk, I think, at 2.30 today about this. Um, if you're interested in this, um, I, I know I am. Um, come to that talk and find out. Um, and then, um, thank you to Alexandra Fedorova for this slide. She couldn't make it. She was going to do a talk on this, but uh, visa issues and stuff, so she couldn't make it. Um, Long ago, Fedora used a version control system called CVS. Probably the, the old, you know, old people in the room are nodding. Yes, um, including me. I'm, I'm not excluding myself here. Um, but uh, to do the, the tracking. And Jesse Keating, who was a release engineering person at Fedora at the time, did a big project and moved everything over to Git. And then um, when that project was done, there's, if you can go find a really old mailing list message about all the next things we should do to take advantage of Git, now that we are using Git for this, we're no longer trapped in the limitations of CVS. Um, and then he got a job at GitHub, and um, now, and probably a lot of the reason GitHub was very successful, honestly. Uh, he was awesome. He is awesome, he's not dead. Um, but <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, thank you, Jesse. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, but like there's a lot of that, that that stuff just stalled, and I think we should really get back to that. I think there's a lot of powerful things that we could do in using Git for uh, what Git can do. Uh, use a merge request workflow like most projects use for spec files, even if we have like automated things that where you know you do it, and if it goes through the basic tests, it automatically gets gets merged. I don't want to add a whole lot of overhead to the packaging process because it's annoying enough as it is. The idea is to make it easier and more automatic. I really think we need to invest in this, um, which leads me to the next thing. Um, so Red Hat has a project called Conflux. It is a new build system based around uh, Tecton pipelines in Kubernetes. I am very excited about this because I think it's a once in a decade, you know, a generational chance to really make a big improvement to our build system. Uh, Koji, Bodhi, and a bunch of you know, things, Punji, and um, I'm not even gonna try and list all the little bits that glue things together in it, um, have served us really well, but they're also, pretty old and only a few people know how to really make all of the stuff work together, which um, keeps me up at night, um, keeps those people up at night because um, they are the only people who can do things. And also, like, if we bring new people into the project, uh, something like, you should learn to be a Koji expert. Um, it, First of all, good luck with that us. And also, we're not doing anybody any real favors by like, here, you can dig into this very deeply Fedora-specific thing and become an expert there. Whereas, you know, the, the basic technologies that this uses are very common cloud-native industry standard things that uh, are both things where there's a whole bunch of people out there with knowledge around this who aren't involved in Fedora, who if we start doing these kind of things, could be, they'd be like, oh yeah, I could contribute to that. I had, she like three different people say that to me when I talked about this at the Fedora booth at Red Hat Summit. They're like, oh yeah, I've like never been involved in Fedora, but this sounds cool. So this is a way we can maybe draw more people from the outside into the infrastructure. And also, if we have new people who don't know anything about this, they're actually learning about things that um, are probably relevant to job opportunities and whatever else going on in the world today. So I think that's good. Um, I want to make it really clear that this is not a Red Hat says you must use this. You will not hear anything from um, the what Red Hat wants thing or, the, or from the Conflux team that this is being you know, forced on Fedora. I also know Red Hat has a really bad track record from with, hey, Fedora, we made something cool, or hey, Fedora, we're doing something in our infrastructure and you should use it to be aligned. If you don't, you're not going to be aligned with us. And then you know, a year later, uh, Fedora is the only 
thing using that thing, and then Red Hat says, well, no one's using that, we'll cut the funding. Um, so uh, I am, for reasons, pretty confident that that will not happen this time, but I can understand some skepticism around that. Um, I think that Ralph and the team will uh, hopefully overcome that skepticism, but we'll see. Um, it's not something we have to do, but I think this would be a really um, nice way to implement some of those um, the Git-based workflows around this. Um, and yeah, and it also has an architecture which I think is very different from the way uh, Koji works in, in uh, whether um, onboarding to being a packager with what we have right now. So basically the first step in becoming a packager is make the perfect package, build it somewhere, and then find somebody to review it, uh, which like, like it, it's kind of backwards there. And so with Conflux, we could actually make it possible for anybody to start building a package and then it actually does a validation at the end of your build that says, did you meet all of the standards that we you know, need for a package in Fedora? So people could start right there and then when they, once they've got all the you know, check boxes checked, say, hey, I've got this package ready, can someone review it? And with this, for example, so, and we kind of have that in the copper system right now, but uh, that's a very different, like it's a separated system from what's in, you know, in Koji and how we actually, you know, what we do for their, our into Fedora Linux things, which uh, I think a while ago I saw some graphs about, you know, the number of packages in Koji keeps going up and the number of packages in the distro proper is more, more flat. Um, I think there are a lot of things that could actually be pulled over, but people have like, it's not worth the bother to switch to a new system, this is working fine. I think if we had it, um, much more tightly linked, so it's just a matter of, oh yeah, I would like to you know, now promote this from my copper style project to something that is a actual in Fedora Linux. I think that would be, uh, yeah, that, that would be cool. Uh, it's also, uh, uh, I, I, for most packagers in, in daily workflow, I think that um, going through the, the, that git merge request or even using fed package is probably going to be you know, the way. You won't need to like log in to, um, Conflux and you know, mess with things or see what's going on there. That should be mostly transparent. But if you want to, you should be able to log in and like redesign the pipeline without any, again without any special permission to do it. Like I would think that we should build our RPMs this way. I think we should build you know, Rust packages. What if we built Rust RPMs like this? And you can build the pipeline to do that, and then say, hey, I've made this. I'm getting a two-minute warning. Okay, I can I almost I can do two minutes. Um, yeah, uh, we could build that pipeline and then instead of saying, you know, hey, here's a theoretical idea, which if, you, uh, if you've ever tried to bring a theoretical idea to Fedora Devel, you will find all of the holes in your, like there's a lot of like, no, that's impossible that will come up when you do that. And when you can say, here, look, I made a thing, um, you can get people more like, oh, you could fix it if you did this, or it does this wrong, do that, and you can actually get, you know, I think it's a lot more easy, it is easier to get a productive discussion when you start with something that actually works. Even if it doesn't work the way people think it should, it's a much stronger approach. And this, I think, will make it easy for people to do that, which will lead to possibilities for a lot more innovation in all over how we do things in Fedora. Um, yeah, uh, so, okay, I have two, more, two minutes, but <laughs> one minute probably. There's a lot of change I'm talking about in all of this, um, and I know that can be very scary. Um, but I think it's good. <laughs> like this is this is what Fedora is about. We are about uh, you know, finding new, exciting things, following them, making you know, being being the first, being on the leading edge. But I've, as I've been repeating for the last ten years, we don't want to be on the bleeding edge. And uh, one of the Debian developers a long time ago said something like. To work on a Linux distro, you be, have to be willing to accept tepid change for the somewhat better, um, which, uh, you know, sometimes these big leaps are really hard to take. And uh, even as we kind of go to these new things, we want to do them kind of slowly and carefully because the big leaps often fall on their face. So I think we want to do the big things in a careful way, but maybe do them a little faster than tepid change because tepid shouldn't be Fedora. Um, yeah, um, okay, um, yes, there's out of time. Well, 
Good. Um, so here we are at Flock. Um, let's talk about all this stuff, other things people are interested in, and get to work on things. Thank you, everyone. I guess we don't have time for questions, um, but there is a Fedora Council panel discussion later. I think we have a FESCO panel discussion coming up next, Engineering Steering Committee, and then the Council one, so that's a good place to talk about all that or grab me in the hallway track um, and 